Welcome back to the Senate Education, Tuesday, April 19th, 39. Uh, on Friday, we asked <coughs> Senator Terenzini and Mr. Cannon uh, to come up with some language around uh, this broadly speaking Holocaust studies. Senator Terenzini had put in a bill with about 15, 16 other senators trying to understand the status of Holocaust education in public schools. And uh, he and Mr. Fannin were kind enough to spend some time together, carve some time out of their day uh, to see if there might be a path forward on some of this. So if it's all right with you, Senator Terenzini, I'll just have Mr. Fannin, since he's right here, uh, just say a few words about you know, where, where you're at and a little bit about the process. Certainly, thank you. All right, for the record, Jeff Fannin, Vermont NDA, hello, Senator Terenzini. Uh, we spoke about, uh, Two hours ago, I guess it was, um, finally caught up. Um, we had concerns about the, the earlier uh, language in, in the bill. Um, and I, I asked Senator Terenzini about his bill, um, yeah. which is, we then looked at this. Um, and, and I said, we would be, we could live with a report or study, however you want to frame it, um, along these lines. And I think that the, uh, I don't put words in your mouth, but I think I think we both agreed that I would, could be a, a step forward, a path forward here. Um, and I'll let him speak for himself, obviously. But but um, we had concerns about the state, the shared Friday, telling schools, if you will, what the curriculum had to be, um, and that was a concern. Already in, in the uh, went back and looked at the uh, education quality standards. Um, there is, uh, you know, certainly guidance in there that one could say this is part of it already. Okay. In many schools, I did speak with some teachers, they do teach the Holocaust. Uh, surprised to learn that some may not be. Sure. Uh, Senator Terenzini shared with me a story that he had heard where some kids were not getting it. Um, but currently under law, the school boards have the obligation to develop curriculum, and I'm sure they turn to their administrators and teachers and and coordinate with them. So that's under existing law. Um, and, you know, that's not working for particular students. I, they have the avenue. There are some unique circumstances he mentioned today, but certainly students and parents, administrators, teachers, anybody could you know, petition the school board and, and uh, seek, you know, a Holocaust studies unit, I guess. But I think in this way, what we're asking the Secretary of Education to do is um, look into the matter a little bit more in depth, give it some, some rigor, some investigation. I don't know, uh, to conclude, I don't know whether my friends at Two Prospect, the School Board Association, superintendents, principals um, are in agreement to this. I did speak with Jeff Francis and Sue Zaglowski very briefly, was not able to eat, uh, reach Jay Nichols. <clears throat> you know, they were gonna look at it. And that's, you know, I shared with them the concept. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind just asking them to look at it and just get back to us. Yeah, I, I'd be great. I mean, at this point in the game, yeah, if, if, if they're I'd just love to hear a yeah, or nay kind of thing. Yep. And I'm hoping that they will be comfortable with to this study. Senator Terenzini. I think Senator Campion. I, I, I agree largely with what uh, uh, Jeff Fannin has to say. We had, a, we had a really good conversation around lunchtime today. Uh, and uh, this language in front of you is largely from the original S-189 that, uh, like you said, I think me and 15 other senators sponsored. Uh, and uh, look, at we know that we're up against the clock. We're in the top of the ninth inning here. Uh, and, you know, I, it's important to me and I know so many others that we get something accomplished around this very important topic. Uh, and after discussions with Jeff, quite frankly, I felt like this was a, a really reasonable path forward. Uh, that I think that everyone uh, should and could live with. Uh, and it gets us one step closer to hopefully, you know, we, we'll learn that um, almost every uh, high school in some capacity is teaching um, about genocide and the Holocaust and, and those civic issues that are so critical to um, the formation and foundations of young minds, so. So the only, uh, you know, it looks a little bit different than what we talked about, Senator. It looks like you've added civics education, which we didn't talk about. Um, and um, that might have been ledge council. Just oh, okay. It That's might fine. have been. No, no. Um, 
I, you know, I think the one ad I would suggest perhaps is, is working with the curriculum directors. Uh, they were concerned about the language on Friday. I think they would uh, uh, want to weigh in or at least have the Secretary of Education consult with them, confer with them, <clears throat> and uh, get their input. This is what they do. Yeah. They're the practicing professionals in this area. And I think we, it, it would be advisable to hear from them in this context. I'm wondering if there's a way, you know, we need this probably needs to be here on Friday, so we've got a little time, but, you know, we have the educational quality standards being examined through the lens of Act 1, right? Correct. And we did have a letter, I know the state board has heard from a number of rabbis, concerned that, and I don't have a letter in front of me, but I believe the chair of the committee was going to get it to us, that they didn't feel as though uh, the Jewish people were well represented within the conversations that are happening around the educational quality standards related again to, to, to Act One. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder if there's something there also that might be worth considering in addition to. So I did speak with a member of the Please. Act One Commission. Thank you. They did hear from several uh, members of the Jewish community okay. on this issue, and there was a dispute about whether to include them or not. So while some may have been for it, others were not. And, and uh, <clears throat> so I don't know which, what letter you may be speaking about. I don't have it. Uh, yeah, the chair, yeah. I, I, the chair of the state board I know received it. And uh, I, I think that uh, the chair and the vice chair or, or you know, co-chairs, where I don't know if their exact titles are worked or will be presenting to the State Board of Education tomorrow. And uh, if they wanted to share that letter in advance, it might be good for them to hear that, have that letter uh, with the, the two folks I think are presenting tomorrow to the State Board of Education. Because I, what I understand was there was not necessarily agreement in the Jewish community about whether and how to deal oh, with this. In the Jewish community itself. Correct. There were two different organizations. I don't, I I don't know. Uh, sets of, of folks who came before the Act One Committee and they did not agree on how to how to deal with this topic. So okay. um, I think if you want, you know, that tomorrow that may be a good place for the State Board of Education to hear something. Yeah. And as the chair of the State Board of Education said last week, there's a lengthy now process to uh, public process. And I think everybody will have their day, if you will, to speak up uh, thereafter. So this is a recommendation from the Act One group mm -hmm. uh, to the State Board of Education. Now, and then there's a, a process thereafter, a public process. We're going to hear from the state chair of the state board related relating to H727 today. Uh, so we can take a little testimony from him on this as well. And sure. see he might provide us with that letter. It, it, relating to, to all of this, though, I wonder, uh, and I'm looking to Senator Terenzini, the committee, Mr. Fannin raises the question of civic education in this. You know, I'll, I'll be honest. Uh, I want to be respectful of Senator Tarantini's initial interest. Uh, I'm not saying it's not related to civic education, but in a way, I'm comfortable with limiting this to the Holocaust. That uh, I'm looking to others. Senator Terrence, oh, excuse me, Senator Lance. I would agree with you. I think that once you put civics education in there, then it just expands it to right. the full discussion of democracy. Right. And mm -hmm. when you're talking about Holocaust education, it may well reach out into that area at one time or another, but it, I, mm -hmm. I, I agree. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally, uh, totally fine with removing the word civics and, and focusing in on Holocaust. Okay. Uh, Senator Hooker. And I would actually expand it a little to include other forms of genocide or you know places uh, uh, what did we say before right. <laughs> global right. Right. and global yeah human human yeah I, I mean right now yeah and I think I, I want to stick just only because it is in I not a huge fan of sports analogies, but the ninth inning, this last touchdown, it's getting close <laughs> to the end of something between now and May. Uh, the final batter's up. And so I'd say we stick with Holocaust right now. And Miss St. James, are you there with us? Yes. Great. Uh, good to see you. Uh, did you hear our discussion where we would like to look at new language tomorrow uh, and just limit this to really looking at an examination 
of where the state is uh, as it relates to specifically Holocaust education in our schools. Yeah. Okay, so you'll, you'll remove the other pieces, great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Senator Lyons. So going along with what Senator Hooker just said, yeah. is there a way um, to look at the whole Holocaust education and, and how it might relate to other uh, global human, um, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> okay. But I think we're just looking to get a sense of what's happening in the schools. Yes, crimes against humanity. Crimes against humanity. Is that, humanity. Is that the term we settled on? Which one? I, I'm trying to think. Atrocities. Um, Beth, what was the okay. what was a good term? Global human rights violations. Global That's human rights. it. Thank human you. Rights violations. Okay. Is that too much? To ensure that the whole class education and mm. global human rights violations. Um, I mean, I'm feeling like keeping it focused, but okay. I, I'm, I, uh, I, it's really is one. It might just come out organically as just the same way that civics education will come out organically. Yeah. So let's just read it. Being married to a teacher, uh, uh -oh. I know we study Vermont history. <laughs> yeah. We study the origins of our country. And I would say the Holocaust specifically is important enough and it rises to that same importance level. So I, I'm fine with just keeping it at the Holocaust rather than a broader term, just yeah. because it, it's equal to me and having our kids learn about how Ira Allen, Ethan Allen, Thomas Chittenden uh, was, <laughs> was <laughs> awesome. Thomas Moore from my camp. He's being struck from the curriculum. <laughs> In another bill. I don't know where I'm going to do it. Uh, so I think we're, we're at a good spot. So Miss St. James, if you could bring us back some new language, and, and if you wouldn't mind running it by quote, Senator Terenzini and uh, Mr. Fannin, that would be great. And again, we're, we're probably, as, as the agency has said, we'll, you know, it will be a few page report letting, letting us know. And, and I think this, the timing is right. Uh, again, as Senator Terenzini has well articulated during this entire process and advocating for this, this is, and we're seeing these kinds of attacks across the country. We, we know that uh, certain books are not being allowed to be you know, read. Uh, in schools, libraries, et cetera. And so, so the, the timing feels, feels good as it relates also to what's happening with Act One. So um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Terenzini. Yes, thank you, everyone. And Senator Terenzini, once we finish 716, uh, we've got you to do the floor report. You're still good with that as we do our final work? Yep, certainly am. Great, okay, great. Okay, thanks everybody. Ms. Russo Savage and Mr. Olson. Ooh, Oliver's in. Now I'm in her room. Trying now. Great. I'm not in position with him yesterday. It's only a few feet from the boat. It's real. Yeah. My kids did that one. What? And they, they were at no. Easter day. Oh, that's right. And, and, and they said, there. And they said, he said, hold something up to be blessed. The only thing my two daughters had. Yeah, the two beer lovers. Yeah. I have a cigarette lighter. I beer. love it. They are I love it. Floor. I love it. They were gifts. That is so great. <laughs> that is so <laughs> hilarious. Sorry, Mr. Olson. Nice to see you. Good to see you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfectly. I don't know if you were able to hear some of the conversation we just had around uh, the education quality standards, Holocaust education, and uh, the report we're going to be asked. No, okay. We, you and I may touch base and maybe with Senator Terenzini also. I think we're, we're getting to a good spot on this, um, but no need right now, I think, to, to bring you into the conversation. What we're really here to have you discuss is H727, and Daphne has uh, provided us with your memo, which I am pulling out right now. It's that time of year when I certainly recognize, or at least speaking for myself, things get lost in email. Uh, Senator Terenzini, I suspect Daphne probably has this on the website for today. Uh, it's there. Thank you, Daphne. Yeah, thanks. So, 
H727, would you mind taking us through your memo? Yes, absolutely, uh, Senator. Uh, for the record, Oliver Olson, Chair of the State Board of Education. Um, what I've provided the committee is a memo that uh, highlights what I would call policy uh, considerations or, or decisions um, that I would encourage the, the committee to think through with respect to withdrawals. So this is very narrowly focused on, on the issue of withdrawals. That's clearly where uh, much of the controversy is. So I thought it would be helpful to, uh, just from my experience and the experience of my colleagues on the board over the past year and a half um, with the withdrawals that we have dealt with, already and some of the more complicated ones that, that we're in the process of dealing with, I thought it would be helpful to sort of break down what we have observed as some of the thorny issues. Mm -hmm. um, and with those issues, kind of where we see uh, there to be pretty significant policy decisions. So I purposely drafted the memo in a way not to sort of opine on what you know, we think is the right way to go, but merely to surface um, so, kind of the, the bigger meatier questions um, that you might want to be thinking about. Um, and then again, you know, the board does not set policy. That's that's the realm of um, the legislature, but, but hopefully this memo um, can help um, frame up what the issues are. So I'll just walk through at a high level and then we can go through, um, happy to answer any questions. So issue one is, is really kind of the whole process uh, for initiating, analyzing, and planning for the withdrawal. So under the, the current you know, five decade old law that we have on the books, um, there's the process that involves voters initiating, 5% uh, of the voters initiating the process. Um, it goes to a vote in the host community and in, the, in the, the, the withdrawing community and then as you know, than the other communities, and then it comes to the state board. And at, at, a, at the surface level, that all sounds really straightforward, but um, as we have learned on the state board, there are a lot of holes. Um, so it, it's very evident that the statute was written 50 years ago and likely was never actually utilized because anybody who tries to use the statute quickly realizes that there are a number of problems and, and, and a number of gaps. Um, so one of the key issues is that there is no, there's no body, there's no person or a group of people who is charged in statute with sort of shepherding this process through uh, to conclusion. So it's been very awkward for the board to understand who's actually speaking on behalf of the community that has petitioned for this um, and who, who have voted for this. Um, so there's a ho host of issues there that have kind of you know highlighted um, there. And then when you start sort of figuring out, okay, how do we want to handle this? You know, you've heard testimony already. You'll continue to hear from folks that you know there's a balance, right? You you don't you want to ensure that there is and the state board feels pretty strongly that there needs to be a process for folks to be able to withdraw and potentially realign with other districts, but you don't want the, the threshold to be so low that you, you have kind of these, these nuisance um, withdrawal requests that end up tying up a lot of time for, for everybody involved. Um, then um, the other big one is, you know, what needs to be done? Like what's expected um, to study and analyze this question? And I, I sort of liken a lot of this to um, kind of, uh, you know, popular referenda that we see in, in other states where, um, you know, we put a vote, a vote out to the po population at large with a relatively simple question. But as you know, through the legislative process, there is no such thing as a really simple question or proposal. Um, and without the opportunity to really study and, and tease things out and adjust, um, it, it's, you know, it, it creates a lot of challenges there. Um, so understanding, you know, what are those requirements for the analysis and study? And, and, and again, without having a, a body charged with that responsibility, we've identified there's a gap there. Um, some, some communities have 
found a way informally to come together um, and have done a lot of analysis. Others, um, quite frankly, have, have not. Um, and then, you know, who pays for all of this? Um, that, that's another big question, right? So is it the, the, the community that seeks to withdraw? Um, if so, how does that get paid? Is, this, is it, does it come out of the municipal budget? Is it the school district that folks want to withdraw from? Are they the ones who pay for it? That's another big policy question. Um, so before I move on to issue two, um, maybe I'll just pause there and sort of get your, your reaction and see if these questions make sense or, uh, to you, or maybe you've already thought through them all. The immediate question for Carol. Please continue. Okay. Um, so the second sort of big issue is the, you know, what, what's the role of the state, uh, state oversight of this process. So, um, at the, when you start looking at this, it sounds fairly simple, you know, community wants to withdraw. Um, it would seem on its face that, you know, this really impacts the local community. But when you start looking at the bigger picture, um, you know, they're, they're clearly, regional as well as uh, statewide implications. So just a few examples that come to mind. Um, so there's potentially increased overhead complexity expense to other communities, in the regions where supervisory districts are uh, deconstructed. I'll, I'll talk about that later. And I have kind of a, a description of, of what I'm talking about later on in the memo. Um, duplication of services, um, you know, one of the goals, particularly as it relates to things like special education um, and other sort of uh, complex instructional needs is, you know, by having sort of a, um, a consolidated model to manage that, you know, there, there are efficiencies to be gained there. So as soon as we start duplicating those services, there's, you know, inherent in inefficiency and increased cost and that's where we start getting into not only regional impacts, but also statewide impacts because we're paying for that out of the statewide education fund. One of the other um, things that we've not seen in all withdrawals, but we have seen in two withdrawals that we've been dealing with, and it's a significant issue. And that is one where a community is leaving a K through 12 district because they their focus is all on the elementary school and they wanna have more control over their elementary school. But in withdrawing from the K through 12 district that operates both elementary schools as well as a, a, a shared high school, they're pull, effectively pulling out of that high school and they're now going to be tuitioning students um, to, to schools. Um, that has the effect of reducing the population, the student population in the high school that those students previously went to, because those students now have the opportunity to go to a broader array of schools. That weakens um, the, the high school that they pulled out of, uh, has financial implications for the remaining district and implications on the educational opportunities because of that loss of scale in, in the, the remaining high school. That's a significant issue that um, doesn't get um, a lot of attention all the time. Senator, uh, Mr. Yeah. Olson, may I ask you a question on the point you just raised? Yes. <laughs> you said that a lot of school districts are, are wanting to, are motivated to uh, separate because they want more control over their elementary school. It, it would it be fair to say that it's really that um, exclusively when they want to keep their elementary schools open or is there actual instances where they just feel like they're losing oversight and direct, uh, uh, being able to direct resources within the school? I, I thought this was just because we, they were threatened when, when the school is being threatened to be closed is when they were motivated. The, the ones we've dealt with, the two uh, that we've been dealing with, so I'll, I'll call, uh, speak to them, is uh, Rip, Ripton and Lincoln. And they've been very upfront about their motivation, their concern. It's a fear that they have that their elementary, the elementary school in their towns may be closed. Um, and that's been the motivating factor. But by withdrawing and their proposal to withdraw, they are withdrawing not just for elementary, but they're withdrawing all of the grades. They only intend to operate the elementary school, and they're going to now be tuitioning their high school students. 
Thank you. So, any other questions on that one? Senator Persa. Um, have you started any conversations with Starksboro? Or they're, they haven't had the vote, so that doesn't, hasn't started a conversation with the board yet? Correct. Thank you. Other yeah. no questions? No, please go ahead. Okay. So, uh, so the other the other issue here, and and quite frankly, uh, some of the one of the districts in particular that we've had quite a bit of interaction with, there has the focus is is so much on the elementary school. Yeah, it's been very clear there hasn't been a lot of thought about uh, special education services, and that's been a real concern. Um, and when we start pursuing some of these activities, um, it, we need to be thinking about how we're going to serve our students with special <clears throat> education needs. And as I'm sure you're all well aware, we have some real resource challenges uh, across the state with the availability of special educators. And as we start looking at sort of fragmenting our delivery systems, particularly around special education services, um, there are some real concerns about how we're going to deliver those special education services um, in, a, in a quality manner um, with that kind of fragmentation. Uh, so under current law, nobody is charged with the responsibility for evaluating any of these regional or statewide impacts, nobody. The board, it's, I need to be really clear, the State Board of Education has no legal authority to consider any of these issues. Our authority is merely limited at uh, establishing that children from the withdrawing town have a place to attend school. That's, that's really the question. And that's the only consideration. So as we've considered some of these proposals, um, my colleagues and I, many of my colleagues and I have been very concerned about some of these secondary impacts, um, but it's not within our jurisdiction to give any, cons any real <clears throat> consideration of those as we make our decision. Um, so I just want the committee to be really clear that under current law, Nobody um, has any, any oversight over this activity from that perspective. So that leads on to some of the, the questions below, which is, um, should there be any state level oversight of these efforts to ensure that there is objective consideration of the impacts um, on the systems in the region and across the state? So that's kind of a, a key threshold question. Then if there is to be statewide oversight, what criteria should be used um, in the evaluation of these impacts? And at what point in the process should the state level review um, take place? Uh, up front, um, at the start of the process, after some of this analysis and planning has been developed or after all of the votes have been taken? So that's another kind of question. Um, and then if it appears that there will be negative regional and, uh, negative impacts on the, on the region or on the state, should those outweigh the impacts of the withdrawing community? What's the balance there? Um, and then finally, um, if there is going to be some statewide oversight, what should the approving authority be? If, um, should it be the AOE, the State Board of Ed? or the General Assembly. And, and again, I, I always come back to how much oversight we have over municipal government, things like charter changes, they all come to the state legislature because oftentimes they have broader impacts that need to be considered. And it's really, I find really interesting that we have this process that um, in many ways parallels what we do with municipal government, yet we have so much less oversight even though I would argue there's much greater impact um, regionally and, and statewide. Um, 
And then finally, should this final approval or disapproval have binding effect or be advisory only? So that, those are kind of the issues and, and some of the considerations um, in that category. And, and I'll pause there for any questions. So I do have a question, but I think it's for Donna Russo Savage, but it has to do with some language from Herb Olson, uh, as sort of a carve out for Starksboro and Lincoln. Um, Mr. Oliver Olson, do you have any opinions on the uh, second proposed amendment that would allow them to continue on their warned, their, they have a warned vote for May 7th. So they're looking for uh, a, a carve out of this bill to allow them to continue on their track. Is that a topic? I'm passing out, Mr. Uh, Herb. Yeah. So, so, so my understanding is, is that Starksboro that has not been gone for a vote yet, but they're in a, a similar situation to Lincoln and um, um, Ripton. And, and I, what I would do at this point is I, I turn your attention to the appendix in the memo I put together because they're, they're, we have a really complicated set of uh, governance structures for education in Vermont, but essentially they, they, there are sort of two main flavors. So we have supervisory districts and we have supervisory unions with member school districts. And Ripton, Starksboro and Lincoln are all part of supervisory districts. Those are pre-K through 12 districts where there's one board that look that essentially hires and fires the superintendent, who's the captain of the ship that runs everything. The the schools, K, um, elementary schools, a high school, the business office, special education, transportation, everything, all flows up under one board. Things. I'll contrast that with the very last page sort of outlines the structure of a supervisory union board with member school boards. If a, if a community and Westminster is a good example, um, they were one that withdrew, we, we approved their withdrawal last year. If you're a member of a supervisory union as a school district, and one of your town, if you have a multi-town school district and one of your towns wants to withdraw and become its own independent school district, it's very easy to have them just, for that new district also be a member of the supervisory union district. It, it's not particularly complicated. But if you look back on page seven, which is the dynamic, the governance structure that Ripton, Lincoln and Starksboro are, are all part of, it's that one unified uh, district. When somebody wants to pull out of that, there's no supervisory, there's no natural home uh, for that for that school district to be reassigned to for as a supervisory union. So what I believe uh, Mr. Olson, the other Olson, um, is seeking to do with his proposal is that he would like the state board to be forced to deconstruct a supervisory district into a multi-member district that's part of a new supervisory union. So that would have the effect of actually creating a new supervisory union with a supervisory union board and all of those school districts now rolling up or being part of that, which is going in the complete opposite direction that we right. have been going down over the past five or ten years. Yeah, just heard that from others. Uh, yes. So thank you, uh, Mr. Olson. So what happened to Ripton when they withdrew? So Ripton. So this is a this is a, Ripton is a great case study and what happens when there's there's no plan, right? Ripton had no plan at all. They they voted themselves off the island. The other communities voted to let them leave. They came to the state board and they were hoping, and I would put hope in air quotes, they were hoping that another supervisory union would accept them. When we met with Ripton and other area supervisory unions, we heard 
very strong, uh, uh, very strongly from the other supervisory unions that they did not want this new district assigned to them. And they had a whole host of, of, of reasons why, why not. And, and I, I think that's a really important point because if we start doing this thing, if you've obviously heard some testimony from the folks in, in Starksboro and Lincoln, if you do what I believe uh, Mr. Olson has proposed, you're gonna hear from all these other districts that are going to be aggrieved that they were forced to take a, a school district that they don't want. So, What's Ripton's status now? So in the end, we, the board had no good choice because nobody wanted to take Ripton. So we made Ripton its own supervisory district. But I should say we first strongly encouraged them to backtrack on their withdrawal. Um, and when that did not come to pass, um, we made them their own supervisory district. Thank you. This has been a very helpful uh, presentation. Uh, my question of you is how many of the schools that are, are schools that are withdrawn from their districts have done so, whether stated or not stated, because they were afraid that their school was going to close? Um, I believe it's only the three that we've been talking about, Lincoln, Starksboro, <laughs> and Ripton. So, so, yeah. so I was just going to say, if that's the case, maybe we should be, uh, what, what have you looked at, or I don't, I, I don't know what's in statute right now about criteria or conditions for school closure. Maybe we're focusing on the wrong thing. Maybe we should be focusing on the conditions for school closure or not. So, because this is this is like this is like very complex. You, That's a question you hit, for you. <laughs> you've hit the nail on the head, Senator Alliance. I think the 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 crux of this issue is that. In, in these cases here, folks are trying to use a governance change process to solve a different problem. And it's a right. very clunky solution that actually creates many more problems um, than, um, that are of a magnitude significantly greater than the problem they're, they're trying to solve. Do we have criteria for school closure or making a determination about when uh, such a closure should occur? Because the, uh, it seems to me that a lot of the uh, hesitancy to vote for joining in with a, a, a district or union district or supervisory district is related to the fear of school closure. And I don't know what's in statute that I guess Beth St. James or Donna Russo Savage or you might be able to <coughs> help with that. What I can say is that the state board has absolutely no role in um, school closures uh, whatsoever, at least none that I'm aware of. And it's not part of our deliberations in what is essentially a governance matter. But I'll let I, Donna's on the line and she could probably provide a quick answer to that question. Okay. I don't think there are any. She did. I don't know if she's there, but I don't think I, there are. I actually, I actually yeah. am, but I, my, my, uh, I, I just lost connection for a little bit, and so I didn't hear what the question was, and I just got back on. Okay, so the question is, what if anything do we have in state statute um, that would be considered criteria for determining when school closure might take place? Um, I think it's important to make a distinction between school closure and stopping operating grades entirely. If a district, whether it's a town district or a union school district is going to um, stop operating those grades entirely and begin tuitioning, there aren't really um, standards, but there are processes that have to, that have to be 
gone through, which which includes votes and in some instances coming before the state board for act, for just closing a school building. So, for example, if Burlington chose to close one of its elementary schools or if a unified union school district chose to, to, to close one of its elementary schools, then I think that goes under the, the school board's authority to do everything necessary to make sure that the um, school district is run in a, in a, in a efficient and um, you know, effective manner. It's up to the school, as long as they're not stopping all operation of a certain grade, then it's up to the school district. And but again, there aren't any standards. It's just part of this a school board's general authority to make decisions for the for the best of the school district. So, so I don't know if you heard what I said earlier, and that is that it seems to me that what we're seeing right now around the discussion around withdrawal has more to do with uh, concerns about having the school in the the school for the town that wants to withdraw um, have concerns about having the school closure. Uh, for me, I'd like to understand what, if it's just a general, just a general authority to a school board, that seems mm -hmm. like pretty huge authority without specific um, standards. That's all. Right. I mean, and just, go ahead. Just, I was just going to say, just so you know that it that would apply to um, any school district. It wouldn't be something that would be in Chapter 11 specifically because it wouldn't be just for union school districts. It would be for any district that had multiple school buildings offering the same grade. Okay, thank you. Senator so I just want to completely agree with Senator Lyons. I think she's hit this on the head. I think we're not fixing the problem here. We're addressing a symptom. And the issue is people, uh, these small schools are the hearts of these communities. And nobody wants K through five grade, uh, fifth grade driving all over God's creation uh, with just to get to school every day. So I, I think that's what I see in the headlines of what we've heard is Starksboro, Ripton, and Lincoln. They just want a school building where they can also have town meetings and they can have the, their, their small kids be close to their families and kid, parents. I don't know how to fix that, um, but I would say if we don't accept this language uh, and if we come back next year, I think we should look at school closure standards and as a state standard to make sure that we're not closing these parts of the communities. Well, it sounds like the problem with accepting that language is that it kind of moves us away from the direction that the states are moving in. But yes, mm -hmm. Senator Perto. Mm -hmm. The Donna, can you tell us that if the difference between the supervisory union and the supervisory districts in, in closing the schools? Because on the alternative governance structure, there's the, the, the elementary schools have their own school boards. And it seems like when those were created in the Articles of Agreement, they put in kind of protections for those, for those elementary schools. And that's why we haven't seen some of those districts kind of fall apart because they feel like their their local school is protected or it's a lot harder to, to close it because they require a vote of the town or they put things in their in their those articles of agreement. So is it is that one of the ways that that it has been dealt with just by creating these supervisory unions instead of the supervisory districts or not? No, that that doesn't it. What it comes down to is what's in their articles of agreement. It wouldn't matter whether the union school district was part of a larger SU or was its own supervisory district. It's in the articles of agreement. Um, trying to remember, you know, there were a lot that came through for the most part. Well, it probably was 50 50. Some of the articles of agreement required a vote for all time by the new but by the town in which the building was located, uh, some articles of agreement only required that there be a vote for a certain number of years at the beginning of the relationship. And my guess is just because this has occurred that in these three instances, it was the latter that 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 requirement that the local folks who live in the town where the school is located, um, there was only the requirement for a certain length of time that they be that they have the veto power essentially. Right. 
But as far as you know, there are some districts that that they keep that the articles of incorporation requiring the the town of where the school is located to vote that that's permanent. It's not time limited. But they just have that right. My best, my best memory is, is that at least some of the articles of agreement that were developed and, and adopted did include that. I, I, I can check if you'd like and let, and let you know like what the breakdown is for that. Those were not, sorry. No, please, yeah. The, those weren't um, quote unquote force mergers. Those were the, the, the mergers where they did it to get the incentive or things like that. So they had more power to, to agree on those articles of incorporation. Correct, but okay. even those that were that were um, that were created by the state board, um, the ones that you call the force mergers, um, even those they had um, sort of temporary uh, articles to operate under. That temporary um, those temporary articles included that vote for a certain, or actually, I think that it was is that they just couldn't close it for a certain number of years. Right. But then they can amend those articles of agreement if they choose to. If, the, if, mm -hmm. if everyone there wanted to amend their articles to include that protection, there would be nothing prohibiting that from occurring in, in one of the state board created districts. Right. At least in one district, I know that the problem is the small towns don't feel like they, they can get the articles of agreement mm -hmm. changed because they're the one small town where they might close the school mm -hmm. and the rest of the di district is saying yeah we could save a lot of money if we close that school mm -hmm. right right so that might be put the kids on the bus so Cheryl and what i'm hearing from you is that and correct me if i'm wrong the big problem that we're facing is that lincoln and ripton there's no place for them to go really if they if they decide to move forward, there's really no place for them to go. Stowe Stowe is is ready. That's easy. But, yep. but Lincoln and Ripton, we may need time and uh, for them to figure some things out. They they're going to have they're they're going to have to create a supervisor, and that is my understanding is that they are looking to create their own supervisory union yeah. uh, to serve those those two communities so we're, we're essentially you know that's where we start getting a you know duplication and fragmentation of, of services but as senator uh you know Lyons has pointed out you know there are a whole host of these issues that are the symptom of of a different problem and we're you know one could argue that the wrong tool is being used to address a, a, you know a, a different problem and creating a, a host of other issues um, is it so if we go forward with the language from the house uh in order to continue in the path we're going but at the same time to address the concerns of starksboro and lincoln could we support um some sort of mandated and statute pause on any school um closures uh in the in the regions that have initiated this process to give it another year or two for these issues to continue to work uh, the kinks out so to speak is that a, a tool that we could consider to address the real concerns of these communities that as far as um, a, a moratorium on school closures, that would be a policy decision for, for your committee and, and the legislature to consider. You know, the state board wouldn't have a position on that one way or the other. Um, as far as, you know, I, I, I do think that we need time. There are a lot of complexities. If, if we're going to be making significant changes to our, our, our um, the withdrawal statutes, we need to make sure we, we get those right as well. And I, I am concerned with some of the requests that I've heard to sort of just hit the, hit the, the gas pedal on, on some of these withdrawals because we're seeing some real problems potentially coming out of them. Committee. Oh. Oh, this no. is a mess. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. But I was just Absolutely. thinking, I was just thinking that here we have these little schools that don't yeah. want to close. They're put, they feel that they've been put in an impossible position. Right. And then somebody up here is going to be start start making decisions for them. Yeah. So we could put them into a little coalition along with um, the state board and uh, AOE or whomever 
to come up with uh, uh, some proposal on what standards might be utilized to close those to close schools that that and that until that time <laughs> until such time as recommendations are made all school closures will be in hiatus now nobody's going to love that one either but i'm just it just it's beyond me if if we if we let all these schools go forward right and we haven't solved the problem <laughs> it's going to continue anyway i'm just it's a mess i need to think about it yeah I like what you just said, but I wonder if uh, more narrowly so that we don't pause the trajectory of the state, if we uh, just pause any school closures for communities that have started this process and are sort of in this limbo land where we do all these carve outs to give those communities, rightfully so, some earned time to work through this without fear that we're going to derail their or, or uh, jeopardize yeah. their schools. Yeah. I, so not the whole state, but just the community. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, Chair Olson, what do you think of some of our thinking? Help us out. Yeah, so I, I would I would think uh, just in terms of uh, if you are looking to put a sort of a more uh, a targeted I'm I think I'm hearing a targeted moratorium on school closures uh, that might provide a little bit of breathing space for everybody in that region. Um, but at the same time, I think you'd also want a moratorium on on these withdrawals. Right. So, yeah. yeah. And, and we tried to do sure. that with the state board tried to do that informally. Of course, we didn't have the power. We tried to do that informally with Ripton and, and the community, or the district it was seeking to withdraw from and, and essentially said, hey, you're heading down a really bad path. Um, why don't you go try to work this out? And they attempted to try to work something out, but they weren't successful. So perhaps some. Um, some direction from the, the legislature might help resolve uh, those issues. But I, I just want to make sure we don't end up back in a situation where we're, we have the withdrawal continue to move forward without any guardrails, because it, it will create a lot of other problems, as I've kind of alluded to in this memo. So are you advocating or suggesting a targeted moratorium on closures and withdrawals? Um, I, I'm, I wouldn't want to comment on uh, on closures. That's definitely, as a board, we've not discussed that. And, yeah. I, and, and we've been really careful as a board. We're not in the business of closing schools or making yeah. decisions about yeah. that yeah. at all. Yeah. We're, we're focused on governance. Um, yeah. So I, I would just say if, if there's thought about any kind of a moratorium, I, I would suggest that a moratorium on the, the withdrawal actions themselves and anything else you want to build around that is a policy decision for the committee. Okay. Yeah, I know she wants to say something. Looks like it does. She does. Yeah, but she's fading. <laughs> really want to say it. These uh, were so savage. I actually, there are a bunch of different things that I'm not really sure that you, if you care about my, no, my thoughts on any of them. Whenever you, whenever you um, say, okay. You and I, my, my, my uh, internet is unstable. I'm going to do the, take the video off just to hope okay. that it'll stay in touch. One is a, about a moratorium. Um, just as a practical matter, the, the, the process that the state board has had to create because the current 724 withdrawal statute is, is so deficient. Um, it's had to create this process where it conditionally approves of the, the, a new school district so that new school district can um, elect a school board so there is an entity that has some authority to, to negotiate withdrawal. And, and you know, so it, it ends up being quite a long drawn out process under the current statute. And, um, I think that uh, the, the very earliest that any district would be withdrawing anyway would be July 1st of 2023. So if you were to put a moratorium on withdrawal or and or school um, closure and everyone acted fairly quickly, it, it, but, but they ultimately decided they chose to withdraw, I don't know that it would really affect the operational date um, of, of a withdrawing district. 
um, be because it already is such a, a long drawn out process because the statute is so terrible. And the only other thing I would add on to that is I, I think if, with any kind of moratorium, there, there should be some study uh, sure. uh, in the meantime of, of the underlying issues. Yeah. The, the, if I might also, um, um, I think that, and I don't know if you care about this or not, but I think that the reason that I had been asked to come on today was to talk about the shorter, um, the shorter proposal that Herb Olson had provided you. Um, and I just wanted to point out a couple of things about that, if I could, and it's purely as, as practical again, that. Um, oh, see, I mean, I mean, I, I'm interested, absolutely hearing okay, what you're saying. I don't have to I if you don't want me to. No, 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 I do. I just want to say, I think the committee doesn't feel as though this is a practical solution at this point. Does it make sense to you at this point, Ms. Russo Savage, given the direction that the state is moving in? No, and I, I think that it will have larger consequences than That's just Starksboro. Right. Uh, Lincoln, Lincoln is already also taken care of this. What what the changes that are were in this amendment don't affect Lincoln at all. Lincoln was already right. allowed to go forward. Um, That's what I wanted to hear. So there are yeah. implications in the yeah. support this year. So uh, we need to move on. Uh, this has been incredibly helpful. I think what the committee needs to decide is well. I think we've decided we're good with Stowe. Now, what do we do next? And it seems to me that uh, putting in some of, and this is just me at this moment, but you know, this targeted moratorium on closures and withdrawals as, as, as well as some kind of study so that we're not coming back and just dealing with this stuff in a different way in a year or two, seems to make sense. Does that make sense, to you, Mr. Olson? Uh, definitely in terms of, uh, you know, studying, you know, studying yeah. these issues uh, in, in more detail, I think would be of benefit to everyone uh, involved and uh, putting a pause on, on the withdrawals. Um, again, I, I can't comment yeah, on the, you can't say that. on the closures. Senator Persley. Yes. Senator, <laughs> uh, I have the answer. You've been on this committee since your youth, and now, uh, what are you thinking about this? You were doing all sorts. You were on this during a lot of the Act Forty Six stuff. What are your What are your thoughts? It's even more complicated than you think it is. Yeah, I know, right? And that a moratorium it's isn't going to get us out. Okay. That that there's because the underlying you have to make a hard decision. Like it, it's it's like punting because I know you like sports. Yeah, <laughs> please go. Now I'm <laughs> punting on second down or something. It's like you're just yeah. a, you're like let's get rid of it now. But there's a hard decision to be made on do we want to have local control of these schools <laughs> and what kind of what kind of state oversight of this whole effort that the state made to have mergers to yeah. get the economies of scale. <laughs> To provide more economic opportunities, but has other consequences. You have to weigh those two. You have to come down on one side or the other. There, I don't think there's a middle ground. If there is, it's like Atlantis. We don't. It's mythical. So unless we can, we kind of have to make a decision. And so I think a moratorium is just an avoidance of making. Decisions. Yeah. Hmm. But, so what do we do? So I guess what I'm trying to figure out is what do we do if it sounds like these districts aren't prepared, but they're not going to have a special, they don't have a supervisory district or a union that's, that we call, you know, to actually adopt them. They don't have, therefore, an LEA that will give them the special ed supports. Well, what they're saying is they're going to form their own supervisory yeah. amongst the three schools. And I think, or just separately, but that's the kind of small districts that we didn't think were as effective yeah. for either the students or economically but what those towns say is like doesn't matter this is our town we should decide what we we should decide what the economic opportunities of our children are mm -hmm. and we're going to weigh small class size in local schools you know not, not a lot of busing we think that's more important than having ap classes or whatever other things that a larger school could offer that's further away so that's the decision is like how much state control over these decisions do we want to make or put them into 
a regional supervisor union to make versus these local schools, small schools and their boards and their citizens. So if I were to summarize for you, just take another five or six minutes for all of us here, your feeling is though, let it go forward. We make some adjustments, uh, some of the requests, you know, adjustments and requests made by people like Tim Waters, Dumont and others, perhaps around the threshold for voting, but basically let this process play out. Well, I think you, you, you kind of go one way or the other. You kind of go with the house, which I'd say is pro, you know, merger and keeping along that line, keeping along the trajectory of Act 46, or you try to protect these small towns that, that want more, we want to make it easier to withdraw, make it easier to protect their, their elementary schools from being closed. I don't know, and maybe, I think what the middle road is trying to do is saying, well, you can go forward, but we're going to do all these things to make it more difficult right, than that. Right, right. Because, as you know, Chair also pointed out, there's real repercussions. And the reason we have Act 46 is because we wanted to have state involvement in these decisions about cost and education opportunities on a regional or statewide basis. And so if you if you if you make it easier to withdraw, then you're kind of turning away from that and creating these smaller school districts. But if you make it more difficult or make sure they have a good plan and make sure it makes sense, make sure there's a statewide perspective being you know, a lens put on that, then that's a that's a different way of doing it. So uh, thank you. I, I think uh, the Constitution is pretty clear. The state must provide educational opportunities. Mm -hmm. So I don't feel uncomfortable with the state being involved in the decision making, but we do respect local control always. And um, I in particular think local control is critically important. Having said that, though, I think as I'm listening to you, um, there, and I've, I've listened to others, there's, there's a, we have a period of time now before any of these schools are ready to withdraw from their districts. And the underlying issue is really more one of, please don't close our small school. So I'm still of the mind that we can reach some agreement about the, the little schools staying open. They are really the backbone of our state, like little businesses in our state. So I think we, keep, we go forward um, we can maintain the Act 46 improved administrative cost issue at the economy of the district scale at the same time that we, we, we look at criteria that would allow for um, these small schools to stay open. I think there's benefit to their, we've heard there's problems associated with closure, with, with leaving. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard the same about their staying in, except they don't they don't want to be there because they might close. So I, I think we can make I think that with a group of people thinking through this, um, well, maybe we we won't come to some uh, wonderful decision, but at least we will have tried and looked at all of the issues. And if it happens next year that the withdrawal has to happen. It happens. I think I think what happened with Ripton, I don't know the particulars there, but they were like, we want to keep our small school. We want to be part of your supervisory union. The supervisory union says, we don't want to have a we school don't that has. Yeah, we don't want to have that condition. Like that's not an articles of agreement that we're going to agree to. Yeah. So you're on your own. Mm -hmm. And because those other towns will have to pay for that small school. Yeah. And so that's that's what you know we were asked force the board of education yeah. to give us a force the supervisory union to take us and make them make the decision on what the best right. supervisory union is. And so that's that is a decision that we would make. I don't know if there's a way to, to do it other than doing it that way. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. Doing yeah. that we just say the board of education <laughs> will force. Yeah, yeah. Uh, supervisor, you need to take towns, and I don't know what 
Olson to say about that. This Olson, Chair Olson. That, yeah, that, that, that's your that's that's uh, that's your decision to make, right? So we as a board, we will do as, uh, that's a policy decision, right? And um, what I can tell you, what might be helpful is I could forward some of the correspondence we had from these other supervisory unions. And it wasn't about the cost of maintaining the school that's the issue. It's, a, it, it, it's actually more about the administrative um, overhead associated with that. And there are a lot of other complexities, but we heard very loud and clear uh, from these other supervisory units that they were not willing to take in a new district. And they had really compelling reasons why not which is why we said we're not we're not going to we're not going to force we're not going to impose this other district upon them. So you know there it was a no-win situation. Someone was going to be aggrieved and the position the board took was the per, the the or the entity that is is um, making the decision to withdraw should be the ones to sort of bear that responsibility. Sounds like Essex Junction <laughs> and Essex Town. Same. <laughs> Senator Chandu, where are you at? Yeah, I think we uh, the language from the House is uh, worth considering, and I don't think uh, we need to uh, consider a moratorium any further, so we should continue it on this track. I am going to introduce an amendment on commingling. Yeah, that Sorry. came up recently in my district. But if you all don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> Just so it sounds to me like we have at least two here that are moving in the direction of the house language. I mean, that's kind of what I'm interpreting you saying. Well, I, I guess I'm, uh, but I would, I'm, I'm definitely not just like do the house language. No, no, sure. But I think I just didn't think a moratorium was was as it was going to be a solution. It's a it's a avoidance of a decision to take, which sometimes works out because some things that other things happen. But I think. I think changes to the house language is where I would be. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds mm -hmm. right. Right. Um, that's fine with me. Okay. Yeah. And that's uh, that's what I was thinking about because okay, so what I've helpful. heard this is, this is, great. is that you know the the new language, the house language on withdrawal, is really onerous. So how do we come to some kind of a balance between what's there now and what's in the house language that would incorporate um, Chair Olson's concerns about districts not having plans? perhaps and you know can we come up with some kind of a balance there the, the tough decision is like starts for or lincoln where they feel like they've they've already they've started. started but yeah. this started. kind of puts them yeah. back and go under a different process i think that's the, the tougher decision and and like was said somebody's going to be agreed either way Chair Olson, knowing that we're likely going to move in the direct, oh, I'm sorry, Senator Terenzini. Uh, thank you, Senator Campion. I, I liked what Senator Hooker had to say, actually. So I'm gonna agree with Cheryl. Okay. Uh, so uh, Chair Olson, sounds like we're going to be moving in, in this direction of the house language. So I guess what I'd ask of you, if you don't mind, is be thinking about, in your opinion, what would make this, this language better and work for for all of you. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, I mean, generally- all of you, I'm talking really to, to get us to sort of the goals of Act 46, what tools might you need so that we're not looking back and saying, geez, you know, these guys were never able to, you know, pull their stuff together and we've got, you know, people without supervising, you know, what is what sorts of tools do we need to give to all of you to, to make this successful for kids? Great, great question. I think in general, the 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 supports uh, what passed out of the house. Uh, the the only recommendation I would offer is perhaps a little bit more um, some more guardrails around those withdrawal efforts that are underway, so that if uh, certain conditions aren't aren't met, that you know there's a way to sort of reset the process. I, I am very concerned about Ripton and knowing where they're at in the process. And just, uh, we've spent a considerable amount of time with them. Um, and uh, there, there's not a whole lot of time left uh, for them to really pull all this together. And, it, and if they can't pull it together, we need to make sure that um, it, it doesn't end in failure. 
Uh, so some, I think some stronger guardrails there would be really helpful. And then for withdrawals going forward, um, I, I would just hate to see a district end up going down a bad path uh, and w without somebody at the state level saying, yeah, this makes sense or there's a problem here. And, and that's why I come back to having these things come before the, the legislature, I think would be in the, in the same way that charter changes do for municipal governments, I think is really yeah. probably the, the right way to go. Yeah. Would you, uh, I, I know you're incredibly busy and uh, really doing volunteer work for the state. Is there a way, though, for you to find some time to work with our Ledge Council on this? On, yeah, on the guardrails in particular? The guardrails, yep. you know, for again, we don't want to look back and say things went to pot and now we don't know what to do with yep. the spotlight, given the time shortage and all that. The yep. same James, do you mind working? And, and also Ms. Russo Savage as well. Absolutely, yeah. I'd be happy to. Okay. Ms. St. James is say no. <laughs> I would never, I, I can't say no. Um, Think about it. Beth St. James, off, Office of Legislative Council. Can I just make sure that I understand where you're going? Sure. That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> Do we? Please, I, I haven't exactly been as articulate at as I sometimes can be today. So please go ahead. So you are hoping or you're asking uh, the State Board of Education with the support of Donna Russo Savage um, <laughs> to work with me to draft language that puts a guardrail on the withdrawals underway. Is the first one. Is that accurate? I would say that is accurate. I'm looking around. Well, please. Isn't that what it I would say the current bill has a bunch of guardrails around. Right. Those two. So they're, that's my question. Like that's that's their that's their beef, right? They're saying like we don't like these guardrails. So the, the question is, do we want to pull away guardrails, like making it like not the sixty percent vote or the five percent in all the towns or the different things? Oh. Do we? Those are all guardrails. Plus, there's guardrails that say if this, even if you started, if you didn't start by a certain time, you have to abide by it. By those rules and not the current rules, right? Which so are, there's which, no rules, Oliver. Yeah, if I could just to clarify, the guardrails I was speaking with about are for the withdrawals that are underway. So, so Beth, um, I, I, you know, so I'm thinking of what's happening with with Ripton uh, as an example. There's there's nothing that. Um, says if they if they don't meet certain criteria at certain time that it all comes to an end. Right. Ripton's yeah. already drawn. Right. Haven't they? Oh. Well, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> they're in that they're in that funny situation that I was talking about where they're con they've conditionally been approved as a new school district so that they can do certain things on behalf of a new school district in the future, but they haven't yet become responsible for the education of their students. So, so let me give you an example, if, if, I, if, if I could just yeah, take one minute with, with Ripton, right? So, so in January, the state board kind of completed the process with Ripton. We made their own supervisory district to be operational in, uh, as of July 1st next year, okay? That means that they need to, by this fall, they need to put together a plan. They need to figure out how they're gonna hire a superintendent, special educators, all of the other things that happen in a supervisory union. They need to put together teacher contracts, principals, all of that, and then put together a budget later this fall, early winter, that'll be ready to go out to print next March, right? As far as I can tell, there's been very little progress towards that. And the clock is ticking. So if we get to say August or September and they don't have a plan, they don't know who they're gonna hire as a superintendent, bearing in mind that there, there aren't a lot of superintendents available to hire right now. Same with special educators. And all of a sudden we get to September and it looks like there's no plan. There's nothing in, in any of the statutes that exist or in the bill right now that 
provides anybody with the authority to say, this is ridiculous. We need to bring a stop to this. Because keep in mind, if we then want them to revert back to the original district, that original district needs to accommodate all of that in their budget. So it just becomes a huge mess. Yeah, and this is what I'm talking about. I mean, what are we doing for kids that are going to school? Uh, you know, it, it, I, I share your concern. I, I think everybody does. I mean, in, in September, I'm not sure what to do about it, but I, I absolutely share your concern. This could go the wrong way, and then who's going to have the authority? We're not in session. Who's going to have the authority to make the adult decisions that somebody may have either didn't fulfill their promises or for whatever reason something didn't happen? Yeah. Beth, on a question on the on chunk two, the way I remember when we went through it is that for Lincoln and Starksboro, they would basically have to go back to start to. to no. To the beginning. No. no. Just, so, just start from so chunk two is the withdrawal section, prospectively, yeah. that would apply okay. to anyone who has not started the withdrawal process. Oh, chunk so chunk two, three deals with all of those. Yeah. So, so the first section in chunk one <coughs> was addressing Ripton. Or, I'm sorry, the first section in chunk three was addressing chunk Ripton. Three. The second session was addressing Stowe. The third section was addressing Ripton. I'm sorry, uh, Lincoln. And then the fourth section in chunk three was addressing uh, any, uh, any situation where a town that wants to withdraw had voted to withdraw, but the vote had not gone to the other member districts or member towns yet. Which is basically start. So they have to yeah, starts. So ch the the fourth section in chunk three right. applies to all of, uh, uh, I guess, Starksboro. I'm not aware of the facts surrounding Starksboro, but if, if that's, if, if you think that town fits that situation, then Starksboro. Um, you know, that's a policy decision for you on whether or not you want to to allow towns that have initiated any step of the withdrawal process to have to finish the withdrawal process under current law as it sits today or under the law as passed, if it's passed by the legislature this session. So that's a, that's a policy decision. Um, right. But, but right now, the way it is now, Lincoln and Starksboro would have, would kind of, would, would follow, they would kind of be moved to chunk two no, not Lincoln. Starksboro, yes, but the not Lincoln. Lincoln. Lincoln has just a separate rule. Lincoln has the same. Have. Lincoln has the same carve out as Stowe does, which is um, the state board. They have to give a um, a plan to the state board. The state board has to approve it while okay. issuing an advisory opinion saying we think this is a good plan or a bad plan. Right, right, right. And then the voters. <laughs> have the opportunity to say, Ooh, the state board says this is a bad plan, or even if the state board says it's a good plan, uh, they have the opportunity to, to ask the state board to undo what they've, they've asked them to do. But there is no automatic mechanism for the state board or the legislature or any state entity to say, you cannot go forward. It's ultimately left up to the voters with input from the state. I think we're going we're going to the floor in just a moment. So I think one area that we are in agreement on uh, is that we do need indeed some guidance if a town like Ripton come September isn't ready to go. Where does that responsibility going fall? We're not in session. The only spot that I'm thinking is either AOE or the state board. And I'm wondering if uh, you, Mr. Olson, might work with Ms. St. James and Ms. Russo Savage to at least handle that question for us and maybe come back to us tomorrow with, with, with an answer. Quick, quick question. Please, has, quickly. has Ripton selected a cool board? Does Ripton have a board? Yes. Ripton. Board? Ripton does have a school board. They've had one for, for many months now. Um, so they have an entity that now represents their interests. 
Is that assignment sort of, does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Thank you all. Uh, we're gonna be at this all week um, and probably have something ready to go early next week. And, and I'll, I'll forward the committee a letter we received from the Rutland Northeast Supervisory Union, uh, which I, I think uh, Senator Hooker and Senator Terenzini might find interesting. And it's an example of kind of what we as a board were hearing from other SUs saying, no, we don't want this. Thank you, everybody. See you on the floor. Thanks, Ticker. Thanks, everybody.